Hi, my name is Robbie Thompson and I'm here with Charlie, Charlie Walker, good friend and uh, consider him quite a mentor in, in all things community. So great to see you again, Charlie. Yeah, just, right, Robbie, thanks for coming. And you just got yeah. back from New Zealand? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, went, I used to live in New Zealand for quite a few years and uh, it's just an incredible place, um, as Australia is. But, uh, I went over there looking for an appropriate piece of land for, to form a community and I'm still thinking about whether that's the right place or not. For me that is, you know. Um, yeah, I'm a very, very strong believer in community living. I've sort of lived communally uh, most of my adult life. And you're the founding member of Godwana Sanctuary that we're here at at the moment. Uh, yeah. And can, can you tell us a little bit about the story about how you found the property and it was yeah. 1987? Uh, yeah, around about that. Yeah. Uh, 35 years ago. But yeah, we were very, very, very lucky with this, this land. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we were, this was a classic example of how uh, the future can go because it was 35 years ago and at that particular point in time all the all the farmers in this area this is New, northern new south wales around byron bay in the hinterland around byron bay and um, for a number of uh, global economic reasons all the farmers in this area were bankrupt they were literally bankrupt in the sense that they could not sell their products anymore. They, they could not sell their meat and they could not sell their dairy products anymore. Very briefly, that was because the whole of Europe suddenly stopped trading. Without giving any warning, they stopped trading with Australia and New Zealand. They couldn't give any warning because it was a secret political deal. And um, so suddenly all the farmers around here, this whole region between, say, 45, 50 kilometers between Byron Bay and Nimbin, known as the Rainbow Region, suddenly you had hundreds and hundreds of farms available mm. for you and I to buy for almost nothing. You know, like, uh, we can't see it on the video, but right just uh, 50 meters, 100 meters from here is an incredible view right over the Pacific Ocean. So we've got a whole hill, 100 acres, right next to the Pacific Ocean, some of the most beautiful beaches mm. in the world, and um, absolutely beautiful land and area. And we paid $150,000 for that whole 100 acres. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was because the farmer was desperate to get rid of it. Yeah. He, he said to me, if you don't buy our farm, he was very, very honest, even though I'm not that keen on meat farmers in, as a rule, but this man was very honest, very nice country man. He said, I'll give you the truth. If you don't buy my farm within the next month, the bank will take it off me and mm -hmm. I've got nothing. So I said, well, that's fantastic. Anyway, the, the reason I'm saying that is that we can bring that situation around again. Yes. It's, it's, not, it's not part of history that will never happen again. It happened because the the farmers ran out of customers. Yeah. And we can bring that again around so that ordinary people can have their land back. Mm. Aborigines can have their land back because it'll all be free. Yeah. Or virtually free anyway. When I say hundred and fifty thousand that was between ten at the time, ten or twelve people. So we had to yeah. beg, borrow or steal preferably they're not still, uh, 15 grand each. Yeah. And we had, actually it was less than that because the farmer said, look, give me 100 grand and you can pay me the rest when you like. So and no bank involved, there was vendor finance there? Yeah. Uh, just vendor finance, yeah. yeah. They, they did that a lot in the old days, yeah. that was the method. They called it leaving something in. Yes. So everything was very different then. Which it can still be done today, vendor finance, yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. So, as I say, we mm. were very lucky to get this land at all. It was like a synchronicity of yeah. timing. Uh, but also, we were lucky that there happened to be a dozen people who were 
very, very committed to living in community. Yeah. So you, you have to find, if you, if you want to live in community, unless you're a millionaire and you can just buy it, you need to be a multi-millionaire around Byron Bay now to buy yeah. it. But that could be temporary as well. Yeah. And just to explain these terms to those of you who aren't familiar with real estate uh, deal terms, a vendor finance means that instead of using a bank to borrow money, as Charlie mentioned, there's, there's money left in the deal that is still owed to the, to the vendor or the seller, and the seller becomes the bank then. Uh, so you may pay an interest rate to the seller in this case. Did you pay an interest rate or was it interest no, free? No, it was interest free. An interest free loan over, over a certain term? No, it was actually two years. Over two years, yeah. And we paid it off within a year because we realized that we just wanted the seller out of the way so that we were 100% certain that this had happened. And we lived on this farm uh, for a year, paying him rent because he wasn't quite ready to subdivide it all. Mm -hmm. We paid $100 a week for the whole 100 acres, yeah. including the farmhouse and everything. He was so happy. Mm -hmm. um, and being a, an animal uh, farmer, he, uh, he went and bought a huge piece of land way in the land. You know? mm -hmm. So he was really, really happy. He was just yeah. interested in having livestock. Yes. And this community was originally an Osho community? Yeah. Set up? Yeah. yeah. The, um, the reason why all the people involved were willing to trust, and you've got to have a lot of trust if you're mm. putting money together and to buy a bit of land. You've got mm. to have a lot of trust. So we were lucky that all the original people had already had many, many years of experience living in ashrams and shared houses. Mm -hmm all over the place. But the particular teacher who inspired lots of communities around the world had a real focus on community and said, if you're a spiritual person and you're just sitting in a cave on your own somewhere, uh, it's very easy to think how beautiful you are and whatever, but you try, you, you put it to the test, living together in community, and you'll find that you're not as perfect as you think you were. Mm -hmm. you know? So, and people might say, well, why would I bother, you know? But if you really want to grow, you, you, you have to kind of expose yourself to other people's opinions about you and yeah. to tell you that you're talking bullshit or your, your visions are crazy or whatever. You know? Yeah. But hopefully in the nicest possible way. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, you, you can help each other to fulfill all your dreams or everybody's dreams, even if you don't agree with them, you know, um, that's the whole point. The, the, whole, the whole point of community is to help each other to be happy. Yeah. What other point is there in, in this Exactly. World? And as the first in, intentional community was the first one in, in the Byron region? This, this was the first legal, what they called multiple occupancy. Okay. The, the government at the time was a Labour government run by a guy called Bob Carr, who was a kind of a visionary politician. And he realised that uh, he wanted people to move out of the cities and repopulate the countryside. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was virtually... The opposite of what they're doing now, the sardine c cities. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's hard to understand bureaucrats, yeah. what their motivation is, but it's often economic and control, power and control. Yeah. You know, if they can get people in a situation where they can very easily tax them, that's the main thing, because governments are very expensive. Yep. They've made themselves very, very expensive with very big pensions. And so they've got to make sure that everything is directed towards money coming into their yep. pocket. Yeah. Whereas at that time when we started this, it was not like that at all. There was virtually no government around here. Yeah. Um, and how about town planning? Were there many hurdles with them to get across the line? Well, again, we were very, very lucky because uh, Byron Bay had a Green Council. Mm -hmm. um, okay, some, some Labour councils would have possibly been just as sympathetic, but we were particularly lucky because uh, Byron Bay had become a ghost town. All the farmers were bust, all the abattoirs were bankrupt and closed down. The whaling station was closed down and bankrupt. Mm -hmm. 
so it was a ghost town and the surfies and the hippies and the alternative people suddenly thought wow you know this is an incredibly beautiful place and mm. you can buy a cottage here for 50 grand you know? mm. now it's like one and a half million you know it's very unfortunate yeah. that's happened yeah. but so it was a very unusual situation and we went to the planning department and said we want to buy this particular farm and we want planning permission under the new government thing and they said fantastic mm -hmm. uh, how can we help yeah we'll do anything we, we can to help you guys because we need to prove that uh, multiple occupancy is a valid viable thing yes and once you, once we've proved it can work with you we'll give planning permission to lots of people and mm -hmm. it didn't cost us a single dollar all this bureaucracy help they gave us didn't cost us anything unfortunately now if you, if you buy 100 acres and try and get planning permission you've got to be really patient yeah and you've got to, it will cost you 100,000 or 200,000 dollars just to get the permission so you've got to be very committed and with the shares so originally 10 shares did you say uh, yeah, yeah. So, w w and and with the ten shares, did each uh, member have a certain amount of land for their own use, and then there's communal land like yeah. they're doing today? Yeah, yeah. We had um, a one acre, approximately one acre building block for mm -hmm. each share. Yeah. Some of them, some of them wanted the ocean view, so they had to have a smaller one so we could fit mm -hmm. um, five or six blocks into the. They could see the ocean, yeah. but that was okay. It was a good trade-off. And then each uh, share had a one-acre orchard mm -hmm. block, which they owned. So that was their ownership. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the 80 acres, 70 or 80 acres, was communally owned. And that also included community orchards. The reason we did that was because it seemed likely that if it was all community orchards, people would say, well, why should I pay for a bunch of fruit trees and do mm -hmm. the hard work? And so we were kind of human psychology. Um, we knew that people wouldn't do that, and then because everyone else would just come along and eat the fruit that they... So we thought, if we have a mixture of private orchards, then people will plant like mad, which yeah. they do, you know. So we ended up with about 300 um, privately owned fruit trees and another certain amount of communally owned bananas and avocados and you know i mean it's a vegetarian paradise this kind of thing great particularly if people love fruit you know mm -hmm. they can if uh it's it's not as well provided for as it could be here we yeah. could have more focus on a lot more focus on planting more mm -hmm. pawpaws and yeah know, Things like that. And you're a stonemason. Have you built your own house? Did you yeah, tell us a bit about that? When I, 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 one time I did live in the Welsh mountains mm -hmm. and I had a little stone cottage. Mm. And I just missed that so much that I uh, decided to reproduce that building here, mm -hmm. which is still standing, thank God. Uh, no cracks or anything. It's been there 35 years now. Great. Um, yeah, and so I was just with a bunch of friends, I went down to the quarry, and we collected... The quarry's down the hill? Uh, no, the, it was uh, about 10 kilometres from here. Okay. Quarry. So we just um, picked out uh, about 10 truckloads of rocks, and had them delivered into a huge pile of rocks. And then I got all the windows and doors mm -hmm. from the recycling department, in, uh, the recycling depot in, in Byron Bay. So it doesn't have to be, I mean, that, that house cost me about $25,000 yeah. to build. And you started building it straight away when you got the uh, land? No, no, I was more focused on um, providing more community mm -hmm. uh, accommodation. Yeah. So we had a, a dairy bale, as they call them, and we, um, uh, myself and a German guy, Paramit, um, built another four four bedrooms out of the old bay, mm -hmm. and then we built a laundry and various other. Oh yeah, and we probably can't see it, but we're sitting on the veranda of this amazing meditation hall. Yeah. 
so um, we had a, a lot of goodwill, you know. Mm. There were lots of people willing to work for nothing because mm. they wanted, in the wider community even, they came and said, well, obviously you guys need a meditation hall. Not just for meditation, but for parties, um, you know, groups, yoga, mm. anything you like, you know, uh, people to give trainings or teach. So, you know, it, it's really important to have a, um, a kind of a spiritually aligned building somewhere mm. as the heart of the community. So that, so that people can, anyone who's got any craft or that kind of thing, it's, it becomes the heart of the community. Yeah. Like a spiritual heart. You know, so people are doing whatever they want to do on their individual blocks, and um, which may not be much to do with each other, but at least they've got this central focus which yeah. will bring them together. So it's really important when people... Uh, think about getting a bit of land to factor that in with the money. You know, you've got to mm. you've got to sort of make sure you collect enough money from everybody so that there's these days anyway hundred grand left over once you've paid for the land, which cannot be used for anything else except mm. to create a, a community facility. Awesome. You know. And. Any hiccups along the way that are worth mentioning that, that oh. might help people <laughs> decide what you know what the right types of community go for, the right people to to bring on board or to manifest it towards yeah. them. Mm. Yeah, I mean the, the main reason people are, are scared of community mm. because you, it makes you wonder why do people work 25, 30 years of their life mm. just to get a roof over their heads in some poxy little house in town, yeah, know, which might be really horrible or boring. Mm. But they spend 30 years of their life, you know, bringing up their kids there and struggling with mm. the mortgage. And why would people do that, you know, when they can collectively buy a, a piece of land and um, slowly build their own places or start with a yurt or a teepee or a cabin or, and then slowly build it up without a huge mortgage. Yes. And then they're not enslaved for the next... Uh, for maybe their whole life, you know. But the reason why they won't do that is because they're frightened mm. that if they get involved with a, anyone else except their husband or wife or perhaps a close friend they might buy a place with. If so it's nice and simple, but if they get involved with a 10 or 20 or 30 um, psychologically diverse people with completely different ideas about how to use the land, then they're, what they're really frightened of is that people will start um, sort of having power trips over each other. Yeah. It inevitably happens. There was a wonderful film about a bunch of schoolboys who got uh, marooned on an island called Lord of the Flies. Mm -hmm. They were all innocent little schoolboys, but before long, um, they started controlling each other and a little clique of people started controlling and people got bullied to death, you know. So there's a very good reason why people are frightened of community. Yes. They, they know that um, in the normal world, even in the average office or business, egos, you, you get alpha males mainly, yeah. but very often... Um, power tripping women as well who are just so this this urge to control other people is uh, under the surface however nice people might feel or however much you know they come to a meeting oh yeah I want to join this community yeah. it's a wonderful idea you've got to have lots and lots of meetings and how do we mitigate that in meetings like how are they run uh, well and effectively so that just say someone is trying to control others or someone's doing the wrong thing yeah. well i mean the, the, the best thing is right from the beginning make sure that you have a group of people who are aligned in their vision mm -hmm. so they might all be high tech um, boffins you know they might want to form that kind of community or Christians or Buddhists, I and mean, mm -hmm. some of the most successful communities long term have been Buddhist type meditation yeah. communities because they've got a common vision 
Yeah. Um, and they've got a lot of... Um, also, they're dealing with their stuff, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Mm. And they've got a yeah. lot of advice from yeah. the Buddha even two, two yeah. and a half thousand years ago mm. as to the guidelines. So he had, he had very, very clear guidelines of how he wanted people to live in order to attain enlightenment or yeah. happiness. And really, um, I, I would say that the most important thing is that you do get a group of people whose primary um, incentive is to make each other, to create happiness mm -hmm. for each other. Otherwise, I would say don't bother. Yeah. Do not even go near it. If you just end up with a group of people who want a cheap bit of land, um, you will inevitably find, with 100% guarantee this, because I've seen it happen in 100 communities. Okay, they end up living there, and it is a nice piece of land, but the, the personality clashes and the sort of, oh, I hate this person, or, you know, politics. Mm. If you want to achieve things, like building a nice hall, or building a swimming pool, or building a school, even if it's big enough and there's enough kids, then people will say, oh, I don't want the money to go to that. It doesn't necessarily mean they don't want it to happen, it's just that they don't want these people to succeed. Yeah. So it's just incredible how uh, power trips. Yeah. So you end up just like the normal society with some stupid politicians fighting other stupid politicians. Mm -hmm. And they, they all actually want the same thing, but somehow it's... Um, human nature to try and control each other. So right from the beginning, um, personally, I would uh, not go anywhere near a community or a group of people that was not spiritually based. And that's a very difficult word to define, but what I mean is people who are working on themselves yeah. in some way. So they don't have to be vegan or, or Buddhist or anything, but they might be therapy based people who mm -hmm. um, their, their life's sort of journey in a way is to yeah. um, be happier and uh, work out their shit, you know, like, because I have a feeling that we all came to work because we were fucked up in the first place. Yeah. Otherwise, why did we come in, you know? I'm sure there are lots of other more beautiful planets exactly. that we could have chosen, you know. And this is the thing I'm, I'm seeing with uh, communities, I'm not mentioning any names, but com the communities I've visited up north, I've been told by residents living there, at some of them, none of the owners actually live on this community, and we don't, And then you talk to the residents, so they don't know where they're at, and then you find out that the, the owners are actually just rich investors that see a value in investing in community, but when you go to the community, it's a beautiful block of land, but nothing's really going on there and, and people don't know where they are at and often the the residents there are paying really high rent yeah. uh, and not getting a lot for what they're paying. So, yeah. Mm. yeah, I mean, uh, there is a, a community a lot of people around here will have heard of called Bandajan. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very close to Coffs Harbour. And they had a policy right from the beginning that the shares will never be allowed to be worth more. So in other words, people could not buy a share with an investment in mind. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the original shares there, that was again 35, 40 years ago, the original cost of the shares there were $5,000. Yeah. And 250 people bought that 600 acres mm. with its own private beach. It sounds ridiculous, really. Yeah. Right? But they bought that to to prevent it from being sold by the farmer to a Japanese holiday mm -hmm. consortium. And all the greenies for miles around said, no way, we're not going to let that happen. Yeah. So they had a great big meeting. 250 people came to that meeting. And by the end of the meeting, they said, well, it's all very well us talking about it. How are we going to stop this, these Japanese people who've mm -hmm. got lots of money? And someone said, well... There's 250 of us here. The farmer wants 750,000 for this land. 600 acres seems crazy now. It'd be 700 million probably mm -hmm. now, or 100 million. So they said, who, who's got $3,000? Or who can get $3,000? Everybody put their hand up. Oh, I'll, I'll steal it, you know. Mm. And so they said, well, 
so well then. We've got seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Fantastic. They went to see the farmer and said, We can get you the money within a couple of months. And he said, It's yours. That happened at Tantable Falls as well, mm -hmm. where the, the where the Aquarius Festival happened. But the reason I'm mentioning that is that um, so that meant that nobody could be just buying in as an investment. Yeah, the focus on wealth and accumulation. Mm. Um, which is the wrong people mm. owning it. But it did have a downside, which meant that when people were building their houses, um, if they had a feeling in the back of their mind, in a few years' time, I might want to move on, they didn't spend very much on their houses mm -hmm. because um, the other part of the deal was that they couldn't sell their property on the open market. That's a good thing. Yeah. But they had to put it to a council, mm -hmm. and the council, the community council, was focused on, uh, you could say, a little bit more poverty consciousness mm -hmm. rather than prosperity consciousness. Mm -hmm. So they, were, someone might have spent twenty or thirty thousand on a beautiful house, and the community says, "Well, you can only sell it for ten thousand." Mm -hmm. So you ended up with a bunch of shacks, and some of the houses are beautiful because people thought they'd be there forever. So, um, whereas, say, in this particular community here, we didn't have, nobody knew that, like this community, um, as I say, we bought it for 150,000. Yeah. And I should say, I don't own any of this community. Anymore, yeah. So, but um, God knows what it's worth now. Yeah. Probably. Fifteen million dollars, mm. even a hundred times. Mm. Okay. Mm. And so um, that is incredibly unfortunate yeah. in one sense, but in another sense, it was like, well, we did look for the most beautiful place. Yeah. So it wasn't just luck, I suppose. Yeah. But anyway, what I'm saying is, you've got to be careful that people are buying for the right reason. Yeah. My own feeling is, I really, really hope that this whole real estate bubble. Thing around Byron Bay and around Australia in general, it's all gone crazy. Yeah. With every millionaire in the whole world wants a piece of Australia now. So I hope that we'll have a kind of a um, spiritual revolution in government whereby they will uh, have as a priority that everybody deserves free land, you know, let yeah. alone, I mean, there's only, uh, what, 25 million people in Australia. Millions and millions of acres of land, you know. Yeah. A lot of it along the coastline, very beautiful. It's complete insanity that any Australian has to buy land. Yeah. Let alone it an is. Aboriginal having to buy land. Yeah. You know, okay, they have huge reserves and good on them. I mean, they deserve to, but some of them mm. might want to live next to the beach in a, in a beautiful house and they've got no chance. And yeah. They should be able to apply for a free block as a priority. That, you know, all the white people say, all right, you have the priority and then we'll come in later when, they, when they've all got what they want. Yeah. But that's a vision for the future. Um, I hope not too long in the future. Yeah. And it's important, isn't it, to look at etymology of words. So uh, mortgage, what's that mean? Some say it, the etymology of that is death grip, mortgage. Others say it means debt till death. It's a, and I just, it's a French word, mort yeah. gage, mm. which means chain of death. Chain of death, yeah. Mm. Mm. So yeah. They, they had it right, the French. Mm. So, so there's, there's plenty of hints there towards this false light matrix that we've been fed mm. and uh, the way out of it. So you, you were mentioning before free land. Um, have you had any ideas of how you know, uh, more, for lack of a better word, because even sovereigns are a wrong, wrong term, but more uh, free, thriving, um, independent people uh, can take back land. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, the time will come where nobody will have to take it back. It will mm. just be going begging, mm. as, as this land was. We, we were just in time, actually, mm. because the... Um, Australian government and the New Zealand government, the same thing happened in New Zealand, mm -hmm. had to immediately start trying to find new markets. Mm -hmm. So there was a window of opportunity in there. 
and over the next two or three years after that 35 year break with England and Europe, they started en masse finding new markets, mainly in China and India, to sell their uh, animal products. Yeah. It's, it's only animal products that need these large areas of land, you know. Yeah. 3,000 acres for a cattle. I mean, some of these cattle ranches are 10,000 10, acres, yeah. even 100,000 acres. Just burned out with tired, hot animals trying mm -hmm. to find something to eat all day. It's just a complete nightmare. Yeah. So, um, if people want land, want a piece of land, most people have that vision to be able to build a little house for their family and to have enough room to grow enough food for their family. Mm. So they're not forever trapped in a career or a mm. job. But um, what they have to realise is that if they, if they haven't got that land or that opportunity, <coughs> they've got to try and understand that actually it's their fault mm -hmm. if they haven't got it. Yeah. You know? They can't blame high prices. Yeah. Because it's, it's it's their lifestyle and their diet which is causing the land to remain valuable. If the farmers couldn't sell their meat or their eggs or their cheese yeah. or their dairy products, they, they wouldn't bother putting barbed wire fences around hundreds of acres. It costs, yeah. costs a huge amount of money. Mm. So they would just abandon the land and find something else to do. Yeah. And you were looking recently to start a community in southern France. The reason why France is such a good place for communities is because over the last 500 years, um, all the, uh, any sort of social climbers or mm -hmm. nouveau riche as they call them, any kind of knob that's made uh, a fortune, immediately builds themselves a chateau mm -hmm. because it's a, a status symbol, mm. like having a Rolls Royce, look yeah. how rich I am. So you, you've ended up with literally thousands of chateaus littered all over yeah. the town. And these are like 12 bedrooms or more, yeah. aren't they? Like almost palaces. 12, they? 15 yeah. bedrooms. Mm. Yeah. Um, Germany also, there are loads of chateaus. Not in mm. Spain and not in Portugal. And originally just small families living them in them? Or? Well, uh, the reason why most of them are so big was because France was a, was a Catholic country. They kept encouraging people to have 10 children. Mm. So if you if you built a chateau, you needed enough room for ten children, yeah. ten servants. Mm -hmm. So these places were specifically built as communities. Mm. So you, it would uh, it would be um, a community with somebody in control, yeah. aristocratic family or a millionaire family. So there were bloody thousands of them in France. You know, mm -hmm. very big aristocratic um, community. Yeah. So they. But these days, they they found that they can't afford to uh, maintain them anymore. If, if the mm. roof falls in, it's a hundred grand before you yeah. even start. You know, so um, these places are incredibly cheap, and you look at them and yeah. you think, how can they possibly be selling that um, huge mansion for the same price as a as one house in Malambimbi, which is a little on town. a small block, even though yeah, on a small block, yeah which on average mm. in New South, northern New South Wales is about a million dollars now. Yeah. For a million dollars you can buy a chateau in France. But the other thing is France is a very beautiful country um, mm. with, it's a really diverse climate. Mm -hmm. So you, even if you live in the north, you can go south mm -hmm. for the winter. Yeah. If you live in the south, it's more expensive mm -hmm. down near the Mediterranean, but not, not hugely more expensive. Mm -hmm. You say if you get these places um, you can uh, accommodate 20 people, no problem, you know, they, they've got barns, mm -hmm. uh, servants' cottages, all the attics are like five or six servants' um, old bedrooms or Great. whatever, you know, so you can get them in good condition. A lot of yeah. them are in terrible condition and I, I would warn people. Uh, even if they're only going to live there half the year, because legally they can only live in France half the year, maybe. Get a really experienced builder. Don't just say, wow, what a fantastic mm -hmm. place, because it will bankrupt you. Exactly. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. And more recently, you've been looking over in New Zealand. Uh, well, what brought your focus there? One of my problems is that I love New Zealand. Mm -hmm. It's uh, got a kind of a magic 
and the, the kind of the Maori um, influence on people's psyche is quite strong. You know, mm -hmm. the um, uh, Pakeha, as the white people are called, though it's not a it's not a derogatory term. It's like you're either pa Pakeha or Maori. You know, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are a mixture of both. You know, they've been into intermingling for a couple of hundred years. Mm -hmm. now, so. Uh, um, the Maori sense of humour and level of tolerance, because mm -hmm. they've put up with a hell of a lot, you know. Yeah. But very sensibly, they realised that they could not fight Queen Victoria mm -hmm. and the whole huge army that was coming. So they said, OK, we have to make a treaty. Mm -hmm. And they were powerful enough, somehow, with their psyche, to be able to um, get the invading people to come to a reasonable arrangement, mm -hmm. so good on them. And somehow they, they managed to uh, live in comparative harmony. There's no there's no big feeling of antagonism there. Yeah. You know. And did you m visit many communities in New Zealand, or yeah. you know, were you more looking at that uh, uh, land that was available? At I was this. I, I know about a number of communities mm -hmm. which were created at the same time, 35 years ago when this one was created. There's one called the Tui community in Golden Bay, mm -hmm. which is a mirror image of this community. Yeah. And, um, but unfortunately, the same thing happened with the government. As soon as they realized that quite a few people were interested in this, they started to realize that, well, hang on, if we have a group of people living on the land, they don't need a job because they're growing loads of food. Mm -hmm. um, and they can build cheap houses so they don't need mortgages. So the bureaucratic mind started to say, this is not good for our agenda. Our agenda is to keep everyone hooked into the tax system mm. for life, you know. So unfortunately, we're, we're still stuck with this hangover of like the Australian government and the New Zealand government have managed to do bureaucracy even better than the English mm -hmm. that they inherited it from. So people escaped from all that and the religious persecution to come mm. over here to get away from all that. But unfortunately the power, the tendency to power mm. and all that um, has reproduced itself here even yeah. more uh, restricting, like trying to get flying permission for a shit house mm. in Australia is, is a major yeah. job these days. You know, it's mm -hmm. cost a thousand. So it's better to just build one and hope nobody minds. You know? yeah. uh, just go ahead and do it and apologise later. Mm -hmm. you know. so <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so for people out there wanting to be part of community but might love to travel, is there is there the option to be part of a few communities? Is that Do you see that as viable or, or giving your focus all to one? No, I, well, in this particular community, um, uh, a few people were kind of international sort of people in the mm. sense that they had families in, in Europe and uh, Asia and uh, so we, we were never fully expecting people to be here all the time mm -hmm. and that, that can be a put off with community if people say well am I signing up for growing vegetables or digging the land until I'm worn out yeah. for the next 30 or 40 years. So you really got to have the balance between people who are genuinely wanting to join a community, not so that they can swan off somewhere and hope that everyone else will look after them. So we're at the front of Gonwana community now, and you might be able to see behind us the beautiful view and you know spectacular place for you to come across back in 1987 and Very lucky. and yeah. and. Yeah, I'd, I'd love you to talk into a, a little bit about uh, contracts or, or, or ways people can be more secure in, in their dealings when they're, uh, when they're arranging a, a community. Yeah, well, if you want to have an intentional community, then uh, you've got to have the intention clearly spelled out. You know? So if it's... Um, uh, a spiritual community or whatever the, the focus is, educational maybe, um, or vegetarian or mm. vegan, or that kind of thing. 
um, you want to make sure that people are agreeing to that for the right reasons. Mm. So if it, in this case, if it's a really beautiful piece of land with a wonderful view, they might agree to all kinds of things just because they want you to, uh, they want to say what you want to hear mm. so that they can get their share and then do what the hell they like. Mm. So then the community will be pointless, it will just fall to pieces. Mm. And you'll just get people living separately like they do in the town. You know? So it's important to have those understandings written down as to what the community is about. Mm. And it might be an adults only community, um, or it might be a family based community. Mm. And those two things are quite different. You can have a mixture of both, but uh, some people want to join a community because they're a certain age or they've already had children, they've had the pleasure of bringing up their children, but they've got to the point where they don't want to focus on that anymore. Mm -hmm. And they might want to focus on their spiritual growth, being very quiet. They want to be able to come into the community house without a bunch of uh, very lively, alive children throwing chips around or, you know, driving their bicycles all over the place or even their motorbikes. So, so you've got to be very uh, clear whether you want to live in a, an adults-only community or a family orientated. They're completely and utterly different. Mm. So most of the Buddhist uh, communities, uh, obviously that's, that's not an issue because people are there for their spiritual growth and for mm. meditation and whatever. But um, there is a great need for family communities mm -hmm. so that people, um, then the kids have got lots of other kids to play with. To me, it's like living in a desert, really. Living in a little house with, with your one child or your yeah. two, two kids, and they're only relating. Their, their main influence in life is their mom or their dad. Mm. And I think it's much more healthy for children to have lots of uncles and aunties not necessarily related but uh, they're not necessarily their uncles and aunties mm. but all kinds of mentors or so that they get a much more rounded um, experience of what adults are about you know so um, that's really good to have a family orientated community um, so if you have a contract and people say this is exactly why I want to join this community and I'm signing it so that if I cease to be of any support to this type of thing, so you're, you're safeguarding yourself against people agreeing to things just to get their share, mm. or because it's a good investment. We're very lucky in this community because, largely speaking, people are still community-minded. Yeah. So if you have a signed contract, um, and people agree that I will relinquish my share if I cease to be supportive of the intention of the community. You've got to have that because that puts them off in the first place. Yeah. They know they can't pull the wool over your eyes. You know? Yeah. And if someone's doing wrong in the community, uh, have, have you seen that happen? And is there a, a voting system that happens? Yeah. Um, that is important to have a, a voting system because then when all of the it's usually the owners of the community who have the ultimate right to say what happens on that community. Uh, it can't really be any other way, yeah. although it's really good for the owners to respect the uh, intelligence and new ideas and visions of anyone else who's staying mm. there as a long-term guest, because very often they can have fresh ideas and which are very, very useful to the community. But in general, if it's the owners of the community voting, you've got to have a percentage vote which you agree on, which means that something will happen if a certain amount of people vote for it. If you have what they call consensus, so a lot of people in the old days uh, swore by consensus. You couldn't do anything unless everybody was happy about it. But the strange thing is that what people started to realize was that you you create a situation where you've got um, um, dictatorship by the minority. Mm. Very difficult one to understand that, but if you've got one or two people who've got a pet project 
and they're determined that this happens, um, then they will they will refuse to vote for things, even though they like them, because they know it has to be a consensus before it happens. It might be a swimming pool or a, a new facility or a new kitchen or whatever. So consensus doesn't work. Yes. Simple as that. You know, even though it's a wonderful idea, it's a bit like communism was a wonderful idea, but it didn't work because the people in power didn't have the consciousness to know how to treat people mm. properly. So they ended up just as worse power trippers than the than the um, monarchy used to be. Yes. So yeah, you you seventy percent, in my opinion, is the. If 70% of a community wants something to happen, at that point the other 30% probably need to say to themselves, look, this is a fairly big amount of people who want it to happen. Yeah. We should go along with it. Mm. Or even if they vote against it, it doesn't matter. 70% get what they want. Yeah, that's the tipping um, point. Then yeah. they can say, well, our turn will come to do to do what whatever we want to do. Yeah. If you have a too high thing, and democracy doesn't work either, because if you have just over the 50% voting for something, then you've got 49% of the people who are unhappy. Mm -hmm. that, will, that will always fester. Yeah. Um, like the normal uh, democracy situation, they haven't come up with a better one. It's the best we can do at the moment, but um, with sort of unconscious politicians lying all the time to mm. get your vote. But it's the best we can do. In a community, you need a better system than that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. Okay, okay, thank you, Charlie. Is there, is there anything else you'd like to touch well, on? The only thing that I, I would say which is very important is that at this point in history, we have um, a really, really urgent situation. I mean, the planet is suffering terribly from the way that we treat it. So, um, we're all living in separate houses all over the place, duplicating our consumption massively. Two or three cars per household, televisions, all, all the construction mm. materials that are needed, all the roads that everyone's going to and from work. So we're very, very rapidly destroying the planet. And uh, it's easy to say, oh, well, I'll save the planet. But most people, it's just a lip service. Yeah. But in, in my observation, we actually are right standing right on the edge of a chasm right now. Mm. So if we don't uh, find alternative ways of living really rapidly within the next 10 years, then basically we're going to end up with millions and millions of people starving because of the agricultural system. Like 80% of the world's grain is fed to animal mm. livestock. So that's 80% of the food on the planet is fed to the 55 billion animals that we kill every year. Mm. So this is a crazy situation, I and mean, it's like rivers of blood, you know. Mm. And it's going to end up with um, tens of millions of people starving to death. Mm. At the moment, we only have 40,000 children starving to death every day. Mm. It's just horrendous. Mm. And when I say only, that's nothing compared to what we're... We're running out of water, we're running out of land. So if we don't um, get our head together and start thinking, we have to find an alternative way of living, rather than the uh, nuclear family, mm. we're going to have nuclear war, because it's going to be the only way that nations can get rid of the competition. I hope that never happens, but when you've got 8 billion people trying to survive, then people start doing radical things to get rid of the opposition. Yes, it's, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that in modern society we think we're so advanced, but the original people of this land only spent two hours a day foraging for their food and they had everything they needed growing naturally. And then white man came in and said, no, you're doing it all wrong and we'll take over this country. And uh, now we're gonna farm for 10 hours a day to do what, you did for two hours a day, right? To farm for 10 hours a day and barely have enough. Mm. Whereas they only spent two hours foraging the rest of the day. They could play in this beautiful, amazing paradise. And yeah. 
Gondwani used to be the greatest rainforest that ever existed. It used That's to be, it, yeah, 400 million acres used to stretch from here, to, uh, from Karaman all the way to Coffs Harbour. So four hours driving, 100 kilometers an hour, yeah. the bigger than anything the Amazons has ever seen. And you think about that, how how plentiful the naturally grown food was. Mm -hmm. They didn't need to farm. There was mm -hmm. berries to be picked everywhere. As you mentioned, there's, we've kind of destroyed that, thinking, oh, we're so much smarter, we can do it better. But mm -hmm. even in effort, 10 hours, you know, farmers 10 hours or more a day, when these families back then, two hours just needed to forage and, and they'd have all, more than enough for their families. Yeah, we can, mm. we can reverse the whole process and mm. all of all of that rainforest was destroyed for yep. two reasons to get the wood for building and to to um, create meat and dairy all of the big scrub between byron bay and nindy mm. was destroyed so what what's happened is all the, not many people understand why the flooding is happening mm. now and the bushfires same reason. If you cut all the trees down and put heavy cloven hooved animals stamping it into a, a hard pan as they call it, mm. whenever it rains the water just goes uh, Lismore for instance which was terribly damaged by flooding. They didn't build Lismore in a floodplain, mm. they created the floodplain. Same as Mullumbimby, yeah. a local town near to Byron Bay. They created the flood situation and Many of the people who complain about the flooding don't actually realise that they are leading a lifestyle which will mean that flooding will carry on happening for the rest yeah. of their life. Mm. So if you, if you want to stop the flooding and stop the bushfire, stop eating animals. Mm. Simple as that. Yeah. You know? Fantastic, Charlie. Thank you for your, your wealth of knowledge and, and sharing it with us. Thanks very much for coming. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you, my friend. Community is the way to go, and Robbie is committed to that. I, I, I know him well enough to know that, you know, he's certainly got the vision. And a lot of us have got that vision, and we've got to find each other. 